This is a Saving Lives podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today's podcast is going to be about zinc for metabolic resuscitation. I've received word from some of you that you want me to tell a little bit of stories, well, a few stories about things in medicine and whatnot to tie them into certain topics that I discuss. And in this particular case, I'm going to talk about how my interests for zinc all started. And it all began in, I think it was 2019, yeah, 2019, I went to go see Dr. Paul Merrick, who is one of the critical care physicians at East Virginia Medical School, where he was going to be doing a a lecture about metabolic resuscitation, which was about vitamin C, thiamine, and hydrocortisone or stress dose steroids. In that talk, he went ahead, gave his whole spiel, which, you know, obviously I'm a fan of that cocktail, of that uh, Merrick protocol of sorts. And as he was finishing his talk, he also included a couple other components in the hat therapy that one could look at. And that included vitamin C, statins, ARBs, melatonin, which I've discussed before here, vitamin B3, as well as glutathione. But in addition to that, he also mentioned zinc. Then, you know, during all this COVID stuff that we're living through right now, I also heard on his protocol for COVID patients, zinc be involved. And in addition to that, with a number of other things, I've heard zinc be mentioned, you know, all over the place. And this piqued my interest because, to be completely honest with you, when I was doing medical school, residency, fellowship, all of that, I didn't know much about zinc. And so therefore, let's take a deeper dive into zinc and how we could potentially use it for metabolic resuscitation question for you that I honestly don't expect you to answer. But did you know that zinc is the second most abundant trace metal in the human body? Just a quick reminder that iron comes in first place here. And zinc is an essential component of protein structure as well as function. It enables gene transcription and is a, per one of the papers that I cited for this, quote, a catalytic component of approximately 2,000 enzymes. This led me to ask, you know, could we use zinc for metabolic resuscitation? In the pre-COVID days, inflammatory cytokines were something that only certain nerds spoke about. We didn't routinely check them in the labs or anything like that. But today is common knowledge as we're talking every day about medications that work on interleukin and interleukin-6 levels that we check, interleukin-1 levels, and all that. But did you know that zinc modulates the production of inflammatory cytokines? and it is also crucial for the functioning of all immune cells. Now that's something I wasn't exactly familiar with, if I'm gonna be honest, which is what provoked me to go down the road of doing this podcast now. By no means is this meant to suggest that supplementing zinc to our critically ill patients would result in a mortality benefit in a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center randomized study. I, I really don't think that it's gonna be a cure for absolutely anything. Nor do I feel that it's going to decrease independently, at least, length of stay, time on vasopressors, or time on mechanical ventilation. The purpose of all this is to familiarize you with a rationale as to why we should consider zinc supplementation to hospitalize patients with infections, whether the infections are bacterial or viral. But ultimately, this is not medical advice. The medical community has been investigating zinc since the 1960s. But we still have much to learn with regards to zinc metabolism as well as homeostasis. I really am not going to get a deep dive. I'm really not going to do a deep dive, excuse me, into all the nuances and very scientific receptor nonsense that that comes with discussing zinc metabolism and homeostasis. But, you know, that's that's something that the complexity of this topic is, is a bit too much for a podcast and for the sake of keeping you all awake. But the citations are on the show notes. I recommend you look at the citations at least. Many of them are open access and free. I purposefully chose those articles because you could go ahead and obtain them yourselves without any fancy uh, library licenses or permissions or anything like that. The first question is, how much zinc do we need per day? Per the data I found, males need up to 9.5 milligrams per day and women need a little bit less, up to 7 milligrams per day. And so if you want to look at dosages for zinc and metabolic resuscitation, this is a good starting point. But I will say this, there's no evidence whatsoever about what dose to use. The first question should be, well, why do we even care about zinc if we don't know 
who has a zinc deficiency or not. But before I move on to talking about the labs, we need to think about the certain factors that create a zinc deficiency. And like many things, you have to wonder how much could one consume, how much does one store, and how much does one actually excrete. And then looking at the data, zinc deficiency frequently occurs in elderly patients. It also occurs in patients with cardiovascular disease, chronic pulmonary disease, diabetes, alcoholism, hepatitis C, HIV, cirrhosis, and inflammatory bowel disease, amongst other things. Also, don't forget about patients who are status post-gastric bypass surgery. In addition to this, vegans and vegetarians should also supplement their diets with additional zinc. Now, the global prevalence of zinc deficiency is estimated to be between 17 to 20 percent. In addition, did you know that hydrochlorothiazide creates an increased urinary excretion of zinc? This obviously causes a zinc deficiency. The same thing could be seen with ACE inhibitors as well as ARBs, although the mechanism is a bit different. But you say, okay, if a patient comes in sick, should we go ahead and check their zinc levels to see if they're you know, zinc deficient? Well, a low zinc concentration in plasma is not diagnostic. People who have hypoalbuminemia as well as systemic inflammatory response create erroneous interpretation of zinc levels. And therefore, if you want to check a zinc level, you should also check a CRP to ensure that there's no inflammatory response that's going to create a false result. Also, um, if you say, okay, we're going to be administering zinc to our acutely ill patients based on the zinc level, you now know that this is pointless. So I'll repeat, do not check a zinc level to your hospitalized patient who's going through some stuff. And then some people even postulate that a low zinc concentration during acute illness may actually be a physio physiologic function. One of the ideas behind this is that, like iron, pathogens at times require essential elements, so therefore the body attempts to hide them. Basically, zinc as well as iron could be bug food, so we don't want to have too much of that around. That's one of the theories behind this. And so therefore, zinc redistributes in the body during inflammatory illnesses, but those mechanisms are not fully understood. But the organ to which zinc is redistributed to primarily is the liver. Next up, let's start talking about how zinc functions in viral infections as well as bacterial infections, starting off with the viral response created by zinc. As I mentioned before, it's an essential micronutrient. With strictly regulated systemic and intracellular concentrations, and it is physiologically necessary for an effective viral response. In one of the papers that I cited with the author by the last name of Reed, he has a table with clinic with human clinical studies using zinc as an antiviral therapy. This includes viruses such as herpes, rhinovirus, the common cold, which includes coronavirus, by the way, and HSV, HIV and chronic hepatitis C, amongst others. In these studies, you can see that zinc benefits patients with a reduced duration as well as severity of symptoms. This is one of the reasons why some say that zinc can help in the ambulatory setting of COVID patients. However, there's no data to support this at this time. Next up, let's look at bacterial infections. And there's one of, the, one of the authors who I cite, last name Alker, A-L-K-E-R, who postulates about zinc and sepsis. Now, there's pretty much an absolute absence of data where they look at zinc in adult human trials. And part of the reason for this is that we have this knowledge that there's decreased uh, zinc concentrations in acute illness. Therefore, it makes it very challenging to diagnose who is actually zinc deficient and who's not. So therefore, trying to diagnose your patients while in the hospital, yeah, it's pretty pointless. Now, they've done animal trials where they go ahead and they check, check the zinc levels. Then they go ahead and give the animals sepsis of some sort and then administer some zinc su supplements to them. But... These have shown a benefit, but again, no human trials have shown, have shown a benefit. And, you know, to be able to conduct such a trial, we would either have to 
diagnose patients with zinc deficiency beforehand and good luck with that, or empirically provide zinc to an experimental arm of patients. So that's a little bit challenging. There is a study that was conducted on surgical patients in whom they obtained the baseline zinc level on admission, and they found that those who had lower zinc levels on admission did not do as well as their peers who had normal zinc levels. The patients who had low zinc levels were associated with a higher susceptibility to a recurrent sepsis episode. In addition to that, they had a higher number of organ dysfunction. And to make things worse, they had an increase in hospital mortality at day 28 as well as day 90. That didn't fare so well for them. Just like anything in life, there is such thing as too much of a good thing. And now we're going to be talking about adverse effects. If you, consume, if you consume zinc or provide it in excess, you could have the potential of developing a zinc-induced copper deficiency, which is due to copper malabsorption. They have found in case reports that giving more than 100 milligrams per day could lead to a copper deficiency in these patients. Therefore, it's recommended that if you prescribe zinc for, or if a patient is prescribed zinc for more than three months, copper levels should be checked. But one could ask, how would zinc administration affect our patients in the hospital? Well, we don't actually know that. Would zinc, as I mentioned before, become food for the pathogens? Animal models don't suggest that right now. We need a little bit more, we need a little bit more help with trial data. And to wrap up zinc for metabolic resuscitation and acute infections, it seems as if the downsides are limited and a potential upside exists. I'd be, li- I'd be absolutely lying to you if, if the evidence was clear cut. Documents from the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia are recommending 50 to 75 milligrams of elemental zinc per day in COVID patients. To those patients, excuse me, to those purists who are looking for a randomized controlled trial, I mentioned it at the beginning, I'll mention it again. It does not exist. Do I think do I think that this is a cure for anything? No, I don't think this is an absolute cure. I don't throw away I don't throw around that word uh, lightly. And if there was a trial, I can't imagine the size, the sample size necessary to show an endpoint that many uh, academic purists consider meaningful, like decreased mortality. I'd honestly like to think about it as an adjunct, like something something to help metabolic resuscitation, help our patients do better, but it's not going to you know, necessarily revolutionize the world on its own in one shot. I don't play golf, but I'm going to use the golf analogy right now. So bear with me if I don't say the words properly. But think about you hitting the ball into a bunker. If you go ahead and use a putter and you try to get the ball out, chances are you could eventually get it out. But if you went ahead and had a sand wedge, you'd be able to get it out easier. If you perhaps use some zinc in your management of patients, maybe, and I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying maybe, this could help our patients get better faster. Let me know your thoughts on this conversation. If you found this interesting, uh, subscribe and let your friends know that this exists. Thank you all very much for your support. Have a great day. Bye.